Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. All right. Well, hey, uh, welcome to Crossroads. I am Joel. I'm the teaching guy around here, and we're going to continue there today our series called Savage Jesus. And some of you are going, what in the world does Savage Jesus mean? Savage means uncontrollable, kind of wild, untamed. And if you read Jesus's life, If you read some of the things he said, some of the things he did, you realize that there was sweet Jesus, sweet sweet little baby Jesus we all love, but then there was this other side of Jesus where sometimes you would go, whoa, what got into him? He went crazy. He went hog wild, as we say in Texas sometimes. We talked last week about how he got so upset at what was going in the temple that he started flipping over tables and yelling at people and he cracked a whip on people. And well, that's not very Jesus-like Jesus, but to see the complete picture of what Jesus was like, we, ha- we, we not only see his compassion, but we also see his love shown in some of the more savage things he does. So this, mess, this series is about finding encouragement and comfort in some of Jesus's harshest words and actions. And we're going to talk today about something he did that just really, I mean, it seems cold-blooded, but when you look at it, it's actually a real encouragement for us to be courageous and to fully commit to what he has for us. Before we get into that, though, I, I want to share with you something really important, okay? We got together this week as a staff, and we did our planning for 2024. And we realized, we've realized this for a while, that we have a problem on our hands. And here's the problem. We are out of space, which is a good problem to have. And before we run out of space in here, we actually run out of space in the kids' department, And, you know, we have decided right here, one of the most important things we can focus on at Crossroads is the next generation. So we have invested heavily in making sure our kids are getting what they need. We want them to be Bible solid people that come out of here every Sunday going, mom and dad, I want to go back. We have invested in that. We have an amazing children's uh, director, Abby. She's, she's just been incredible since she's come on board. She's got tons of energy. So what we decided is, since she has so much energy... I'm just kidding. She's going to be mad if she she hears me saying that. We decided it's time. Oh, you're right there. Hey, you're doing a great job, Abby. We realized we need to go to three services. Now, if you've ever been part of a church that does three services, it is a lot of work. But we feel like the work is worth it because God is bringing us people and we need to make room for them. The other option would be we could just... I don't know, we could do a lottery, like just say, hey, you get to go to church this week, you don't. And we can't do that. It's just not, a, it's not an option. Church lottery, right? Uh, may the odds be ever in your favor. Anyway, it's a little reference to, uh, what's, that, what's that movie? Yeah, yeah, Hunger Games. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. We're going to three services. We are going to start on Christmas Eve with three services. Now, here's what this means. We need some of you who are sitting there to step up and start to serve in volunteering. And here's what I have to offer you. I'm telling you this. I've been hanging out in the church for 45 years, and I've seen this over and over again. The greatest way to figure out gifts within you that you didn't even know you had is to start serving in the local church. Okay? I'm telling you, man, I I cannot tell you how many people I've met. I had a kid that went, he was a young kid I mentored, and he was moving to Nashville, and he wanted to be a rock star. And he said, how do I become a rock star? And I said, I don't know how you become a rock star, but I'll tell you this. You need to get involved immediately in a church. Tie yourself in, give everything you've got to that church, and serve. And God will open the doors for you. And did you know what? He did. Within a year, he was touring nationally with a national band, and it was all because of relationships he made in the church and things he learned in the church. The local church is the hope of the world, folks. This is where God touches people directly with Jesus's, I mean, he just uses the local church. And I want to encourage some of you, some of you have been sitting on the sidelines and you're like, oh, I don't know how God could ever use me. Listen, we know how God can use you. So what I would encourage you to do is start praying right now about how you're going to step up and help with these three services. We specifically need help in the kids area. And you go, oh, I don't know if I could. It's been so long since I've had kids, or I don't know if I want kids. Well, listen, (laughs) this is a great way to figure it all out, okay? (laughs) And you may say, well, I don't have any training. Well, look, we will train you on tech. We have so many people in the back that have learned so much technology because they just went in and, and dove in, okay? We need your help with this. The church is growing, and you are going to be part of, of, of 
who God uses to bring these new people in. And we're seeing amazing things happen. If you haven't noticed that with all of our baptisms and all the things happening, God's doing amazing things here. And it's time for you to step up. And this is, we're starting on Christmas Eve with three services. The service times will be 8.30, 10, and 11.30. So it's not going to be that much more time. We're going to encourage you to at least serve in one, at least one service and attend another. Some people choose to just serve one Sunday, all three, all three services. Your call, how you want to do it. But the best way to get, get signed up is, uh, first of all, pray about it, okay? And after my message today, I guarantee you're going to want to sign up. But anyway, um, there's a QR code on the back of the chair in front of you. You just scan that with your phone and you go down to uh, next steps. There's a little button that says next steps and then hit the button that says volunteer. Put in your information and we will call you. You got it? All right. I'm excited. It, three services is a lot of work, but we really, it, this, is, this is absolutely necessary for where God is taking this church. So cool. All right. So about seven years ago, my wife and I moved to this area and I discovered my kryptonite. Mountain cedar. It's a tree that grows around. It's like a brushy tree that grows around here. And and there's certain times of the year, if you haven't noticed, that it just kicks this pollen up into the air. And it used to level me. From about November to February, I was perpetually sick. Sometimes it would start as allergies, and then it would take me out for weeks on end, and I'd be in bed sick. And I just got so frustrated. I'm like, God, why did you move me to this place where like, I'm literally breathing in death? These allergies would kill me, and it was so frustrating to me. Well, right in the middle of one of those times of sickness, I felt like God told me to start fasting. Now, I hate fasting. When I would fast, I would just get hangry and very ungodly. So I decided I, it's way easier to be godly when I'm not hungry. So I'm going to not fast, okay? And I mean, I would, I, I would try and fast. Like, I'd set out to do a two-day fast, and I could only make it through, like, maybe two meals, so I always wonder, like, if you set out to do a two-day fast and can only get through one day, does that make you a half-fast Christian? Like, <laughs> half-fast, half-fast, a half-fast Christian. But I hated it. Well, I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to do it. So I started to fa- fast on Fridays. I would not eat all day Friday. And it was hard. I'd get a headache. My vision would go blurry. I'd complain. But after doing that for a few weeks... I started realizing my body on Thursday night started going, hey, I don't have to eat tomorrow. And I started looking forward to Friday. It was the weirdest thing. And during the time that I would normally eat, I'd just go pray or read my Bible. I started doing this. So I was like, you know, I'm going to try and do this on Wednesdays too. Because ancient Christians, they used to fast on Wednesday and Friday. So I started doing this. Well, I did this for about nine months and I started noticing some changes. First of all, I noticed my allergies went away. It's crazy. My cedar allergy went away. And the second thing was, right in the middle of that, God actually called me to call Pastor Marcus and say, hey, do you need some help? He opened the door, and where I'm here, here I am still six and a half years later. That was during that time, right? So here's the crazy thing about it. So I, went, I was talking to a doctor. We were hiking in Israel. Marcus was with me, actually, when we did this. We were hiking in Israel. And a doctor, she said, well, that doesn't surprise me. She says, when your body has time to not be processing food, it actually goes and starts to heal other areas of your body. And she started talking about how people are using fasting to cure all sorts of things from cancer to diabetes. When you fast, we're actually made to not eat food all the time. I know that's hard to believe here in this abundant West. But we're not made to eat food all the time. And so I started, she said, you'll get the same results if you do what's called intermittent fasting, where I only eat during a six-hour window every day between noon and six. And I don't eat anything for breakfast. I'll drink some coffee with no sugar in it because sugar triggers your body and says, hey, we're, it gets, anyways, I'm not a doctor, but bottom line is, so don't take this as medical advice, but uh, it, it changed everything. And what, what's crazy about it is it all started when I fully committed to doing this fasting, but I had no idea what was on the other side of that commitment. All I saw was pain and suffering in my mind. I'm like, oh, not eating? That's brutal. I love eating. But on the other side of it, first of all, God provided an amazing opportunity for me here serving at Crossroads. He also healed me of my kryptonite, and little did I know a few years later I was going to move into, to Kryptonite Central, which is Kerrville, Texas. I literally live in the middle of cedars everywhere. If you've been to my, my house, you've seen there are cedars everywhere. In fact, yesterday I was playing in cedars. I was burning down cedar trees all day, and I didn't get sick. But it all started back there when I made a commitment to do something that at the time felt pretty miserable. Now, here's what I know about you. 
You've got something in your life that you're feeling like you really need to do. Like you know you need to do it. Maybe some of you, it's you, need, you know you need to start taking care of your health. Your doctor has even told you, don't, don't come back to me anymore until you get your health in line. And like you stop eating that stuff you know you shouldn't be eating. And maybe you start exercising. But we all have this thing in our mind where we go, I know I need to start exercising. But if I do that, that'll mean, oh, I'll be uncomfortable and in pain. Right? Some of you saying, I know I really need to up my spiritual walk. Like, I really need to get more involved in church, in serving during those three services. <laughs> but if I do that, that'll mean I won't be able to get home in time to get all my meals set up and stuff for the football game. I really know I need to get more invested in my kids' lives. Ugh. But that'll mean I'll have to do stuff I don't want to do. I'll have to talk to my emotional daughter that I don't know what to do with. I really know I need to go all in on this marriage, but if I do, that'll mean I might risk getting hurt again, and I don't want that. We've all got something in our lives that we know we need to step up our game in. Every one of you, if we were to talk for a few minutes, you already know what it is, but you're going, oh, yeah, but the cost of that is going to be hard. I think we can all relate to something C.S. Lewis said. This. He said this, we're not necessarily doubting what God will do the best for us. We're wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. Yeah, I know I need to get more committed. I, need to, I know I need to go all in. But, oh, how much pain is that going to cost me? And we naturally run from pain. But I'll tell you this. There's a, there's a story in Jesus' life that we're going to look at today where he gets pretty harsh with a guy that seems unwilling to fully commit. In fact, Jesus seems a little bit intolerant of half-fast Christianity, following him, half-fast. There's a story where Jesus is going along, and someone said to Jesus, hey, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, yeah? Well, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He's saying, just, just so you know, I'm kind of a homeless man wandering around here. <laughs> to another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go bury my father. And Jesus said to him something very vicious, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those in my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's brutal. Jesus doesn't seem very tolerant of going into this thing halfway. And here's why I think that is. I think that he knows that unless you're fully committed, you're going to tend to back out when things get hard. And listen, what Jesus asks us to do is really flipping hard. Turn the other cheek, I don't like that. Forgive those who hurt me, don't like that either. They don't deserve to be forgiven. But yet God, God comes to us and he says, look, I'm going to show the example through Jesus of how you're supposed to live. And Jesus did all those things. And he says, man, I've forgiven you. Now you're called to forgive others. I turned the other cheek. Now you're called to turn the other cheek. I made massive sacrifices. Now you're called to make massive sacrifices. G.K. Chesterton, one of my favorite authors, he says this. He says, Christianity hasn't been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. When you really get into this thing, you find this is hard. What he's asking us to do is really, really hard. And so Jesus says this. You got to fully commit if you want the benefits here. Just like I learned with fasting, I didn't get the benefits until I went all in and fully committed. And there's some things in your life that he's asking you to do right now that if you just dip your toe in, you're not going to get the benefits. You got to go all in. And then you'll find on the other side, bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. There are always benefits to serving the Lord. But you don't see those on the front side of the sacrifice you have to make. So why was Jesus so brutal about this, the, the family and leaving the father? Well, I think first, one of the first things is that some, oftentimes the, the people that are closest to us are the ones that will hold us back from doing what we're called to do. And some of y'all know this because you're from a, a culture where it's like, well, we don't, you know, who do you think you are? Our family doesn't do that. Know your place, son. You're from Seguin. 
People from Seguin don't do that kind of stuff. And you say, look, I, I got to break away from that. And they say, well, you think you're better than us? And sometimes your family gets in the way. And Jesus said something really brutal about this. Listen to me. This is crazy what he says here. He says, don't think I've come to bring peace to the earth. Wait, what? Peace on earth? Could will to men? What about all that? He says this, I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Ouch. Now listen, I love my family and I value my family. But if at any point your family gets in the way of you serving God to your fullest, you may have to love that family from a distance. And did you know there's some cultures where committing to Christ actually means you're going to get kicked out of the family? There are Muslim cultures. We had a, we had a Muslim guy that came to our church in, in when I was serving in South Texas. He was Muslim from Indonesia. And he accepted Christ while he was here studying. And he was terrified to go home and tell his dad because there was a very good chance his dad was going to cut him off from the family. Because our family is Muslim. You don't leave the faith. He knew what the cost was. Now, for most of us, that probably won't happen. But there will be times when God asks you to do something, and your family says, who do you think you are to do this? And you have to say, I know, look, I love you, but I love Jesus more. Right. And he's asking me to take the, make this sacrifice, and I've got to do this. Sometimes we have to separate ourselves from the very people that are closest to us that should support us most, but they don't. You know, my wife, Emily, before we got married, she really felt like God had called her to go on the mission field. So she started sending out letters to raise support to go on the mission field. And one of her own family members wrote her a letter and said, we are not in agreement with you asking for money. You have a college degree. You need to go out and become a working member of society. That was from her own family. And she was like, well, look at this. And I was like, ah, losers. She's like, yeah, and she's kind of like, don't call my family losers. I'm like, they just don't get it. They don't get it. And sometimes the people around you just aren't going to get it. But if God is calling you to do it, you need to pursue that. Here's, here's what also he may have been talking about, where he says, let the dead bury their own dead. Oftentimes what we do is we're waiting for the perfect timing. You know? Well, well, you know, once, a lot, in this case, it may have been that once his father passed away, he'd get his father's inheritance, and then he'd have all the money he needed so he could follow Jesus. And he wouldn't have to worry about being homeless with Jesus. He'd have a backup plan. And sometimes God asks you to do stuff at the worst possible time. And you go, it'd be a lot easier if I did this when I had some money in the bank or when I have this amount of money saved up. I see this in our world today. A lot of people are like, well, I'll get married once I've got X amount of dollars in the bank. Then I'll be ready. Listen, I'm just going to be really blunt. You ain't never ready for marriage. You just got to do it. Dive in while you're stupid and young. You're never ready. You're never ready for kids. You think you're ready for kids? You ain't ready for kids. They're going to eat your lunch. But it's okay because if you're all the way in and you're fully committed, God's grace will be there for the moment as you're dealing with it. And the blessing that comes on the other side of it, the benefits that come on the other side of it, you can't even calculate what it's like. Some days I'm like, my daughter just drives me insane. But man, she is such a blessing. And that's the nature of it. You got to go all in and you got to fully commit and you're going to feel like, well, I got to wait till the timing is right. And I see this a lot of times with people, they had their, their parents got divorced and they're like, man, I just got to make sure this is the right time. This is the right person. I got, and, and listen, you're never going to find the perfect person. If you do, they don't want to marry you. <laughs> Every person you get a ma- you, mar- you connect with, marry, they're going to have some flaws, and you're going to learn to grow together, and they're going to work around your flaws, and you're going to work around theirs, and you're going to strengthen each other through that. But you're never going to be fully ready, and if you're waiting for the perfect time, it's not going to happen. You need to just go in and commit and trust that God's grace is enough for you as you dive into whatever he's asking you to do. So I mean, you say, man, I know I need to get my health in order, but ugh, I just don't want to, you know, I don't know if it's the right time. It, now is the right time. So I mean, you're saying, I know I need to step up in my faith. Now is the right time. Today is the day that you need to step up and do this. And, and never doubt this. On the other side of it, there are some great benefits. But if you're sitting around waiting for the perfect time, I love this verse in Ecclesiastes. It says this, whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. I can't tell you how many times my wife and I have wanted to go on. And, you know, we're going to like, hey, we're going to go 
go visit the beach or something, and we look at the, the forecast, and it says, oh, it's going to rain. We're like, well, that's going to ruin our trip. We better not go. But I can't tell you how many times we've gone in spite of the forecast, and it didn't rain. Sometimes the forecast is wrong. And you're looking around the world today right now and going, this is the worst possible time to start a business. This is the worst possible time to bring kids into the world. This is the worst possible time to start being more generous and giving that 10% that I know I should be giving. And I'm telling you this, if you're waiting for the perfect time, the perfect time will never come. You'll never plant. And when you never plant, you never get a harvest. You got to fully commit to going in no matter what the weather brings no matter what the forecast says, no matter what the outlook looks like, because I've seen this in God's economy, what the forecast says doesn't matter. When God says move on something, you got to move. And a lot of you go, well, what if I fail? Well, listen, first of all, do you know what the cure for the fear of failure is? It's failure. You go in, you fail, and then you go, oh, hey, but I didn't die. Like, yeah, and you learn some stuff in the process, and then you pick yourself back up, you put your shoulders back up, and you move forward again, and you've learned on the pro- in the process, and you get better every time. I can't tell you how many things I've done in my life that looked like failure, but on the other side, I see, wow, I needed that to get up this rung of the ladder, to get to the next rung, to get up to the next rung. I needed that. I need to learn a little bit about how people work. I mean, I'm telling you, early, early days of ministry, I did some stupid stuff, but I needed to learn that. And it wasn't a failure. It's not a failure if you learn from it. But you've got to be willing to go all in to the point that you're totally committed. And say, look, no matter what comes, no matter what the weather brings, I'm all in here. Because otherwise you end up like Tarzan, right? Swinging through the jungle. And can you imagine if Tarzan's swinging from one vine to another in the jungle? And he's like, hey, this vine is tested. I'm going to stick with this one while I hang on to this other vine to see if it's tested first. Unless he lets go of this vine and just goes all in on the next vine, he loses his forward momentum. He just hang like a fool from two vines in the jungle. And a lot of people, I've met a lot of people that looking for a sure bet, they're just hanging there like a fool. Because you're never going to be sure that vine's going to hold you. You just got to go all in and see what happens and then trust that God's grace is enough if you do fall to the jungle floor that he'll pick you up. But I would encourage you this. The question isn't, what if I fail? What if the better question is, what if you succeed beyond your wildest imagination? No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has perceived what God has in store for those who put their trust in him. And whatever he's asking you to do, you say, man, but it's, it's, I don't know how I can get from this place to that place. Like, I don't even know how I can, how, how can I do it? The way you're going to do it is by small steps. You know, I didn't start out doing fasting every day. I started it one day at a time, and then I just slowly added. And a lot of us, man, we overestimate what we can do in six months, and we underestimate what we can do in five years. And you got to go in it for the long haul. And when you do, I can guarantee you this. You're going to see God do some amazing things. But it's only going to come when you fully commit to the path. You're standing there looking and go, oh, I can't see very far ahead. And he's like, right, and this is what really requires faith. Because it ain't faith if it's sunshine and unicorns prancing ahead of you. It's only faith when it's really dark and you can't see anything but the next step in front of you. So about two and a half years ago, I felt like God was calling us to move out to to, to start a a retreat center for pastors and and missionaries in Kerrville. And um, I was stupid enough to think I could do it. People often ask, like, how did you think of this? I'm like, I don't know if God used my hubris, my pride, or just my stupidity. But one way or another, I got involved in this project. We went out and looked at the 16 acres of land that was covered in my kryptonite, mountain cedars. And I thought, I can do this. And I got into a project that has nearly killed me on multiple fronts. But I was looking at a video the other day of when we first got these tractors out there to knock over those cedars. And I was looking at it then versus now. And when people drive into the property now, they're like, wow, this is amazing. And I'm like, yeah, welcome to my heaven and my hell all in one place. (laughs) Some days it's heaven, some days it's hell. But I look back and and people, I go, you know what, if I'd have known now or known then what I know now, I never would have done this. But thank God, he kind of blinded my eyes and used my own arrogance to get me in. And I committed to it. 
And I got in way over my head. But now I look around at what God has done. I'm like, man, this was pure God who did this. He sent people to help us along the way. He provided for us financially to do it. We've done the whole thing with cash. We haven't taken out any loans for it. I don't know how we did it, honestly. People go, how'd you do that? Well, oh yeah, well, somebody came along that helped me with that when I needed this, and then I needed this over there, and somebody, God used somebody to provide for that. But if I would have just stood there and looked and said, how in the world can this happen? It never would have happened. I had to go in. And here's what I've found over and over again. This is, sounds so zen, but this is one of my life statements. If you commit to the path, the way will open to you. I don't know how he does it. Some of you are living examples of this. You're like, I don't know how we got here. It's really good right now. I don't know how we did it. But all I know is I just went all in. I said, I'm not going to hang on one vine waiting for the assurance on the other. I'm going to keep swinging forward and just moving in front and taking the next right step of what God asks of me. And some of you today, there's God's asking you to do some stuff that you go, that's going to be really hard. And listen, if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. But God's calling you to do something that I guarantee you on the other side of it, everything he asks of us, there's a blessing on the other side of it. Now, all we see is the pain. All we see is the sacrifice we're going to have to make. All the stuff we see is the stuff we're going to have to give up. Some of you are looking at your health and, man, listen, you really need to take this seriously because you want to live a long life. (laughs) And you're going, well, I don't know if I can give up those things. Well, I'm telling you, start small. Start small. What's one small step you can take? There's a guy named Charles Duhigg. He wrote a book called The Power of Habit. And he says that oftentimes when you change one small routine, it starts at a ripple effect that changes many, many routines. Some of you say, man, I, I know I need to lose weight. And the first step you need to do is you need to just quit smoking. I was talking to one of our guys here that serves on the worship team. And I was like, how did you quit smoking? He's like, I just decided I've got to do this. And he instituted willpower, but I believe sometimes willpower alone won't do it. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to give you the strength to quit some of those habits. But listen, if you get serious about it and you commit to the path and you go, I'm going all in, whatever it takes. But here's the thing. Don't throw yourself, like take small steps. A lot of people go, I'm going to quit everything. It doesn't work that way. You're human. Okay. You take small little steps. And as you commit to the path, one step at a time, God opens more and more and more to you. And you look back and you go, how did we get this far? You know how you got that far? One small step at a time, but you got to go all in. And some of you right now, man, you're at that point where you've got a side business going, a little side hustle, and you're at 50%. You know what the pros say about starting a small business? When you've got 50% of the income you need to go fully on this side hustle, it's time to go all in because you're never going to make up the other 50% while you're still working that guaranteed job. And listen, you don't have to go, you use wisdom, use wisdom, but you've got to totally commit. And one of the things I've found is, man, put a, put a time frame on it. I'm going to try this. Now this doesn't work for marriage, but I'm in other areas. I'm going to try this for two years. You can suck up anything for two years. Like, wow, this is going to be really miserable, but I'm going to commit to two years to getting my health really on track. I'm going to commit for two years to really serving at this church. I'm going to start Christmas Eve and I'm going to get serving at this church. And I'm going to commit to fully serving here for two years. And don't be surprised when you do that if you look back two years later and go, wow, the doors the Lord opened. And you thought it was a sacrifice. But I'm telling you this, as somebody who's lived this myself, you can't sacrifice for God. He won't let you. You'll think you've sacrificed for him. Oh, God, I'm making this huge sacrifice for you. And he will blow open the windows of blessing in a way that you go, wow, how did this happen? And you thought you were sacrificing something back here, but the blessings on the other side are exceedingly abundantly far above all you could ever ask or think according to his power that's at work in you. All it took was your full and total commitment. And some of you are one decision away from a completely different life today. You just got to get hardcore and seriously. I'm not going to do a half-fast Christianity anymore. I'm going to go all in. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you that, man, you called us to great, huge, impossible things. But I thank you, Lord, that you gave us the power to do it. We're not, we're not called to do this on our own, out of our own willpower. It says the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in us, and he will give life to your mortal body. So I pray for those here today that their health, they know they've got to get it in order. I pray, Lord, you give them the power, the wisdom, the insight, the people around them that can help them do that. I pray, Lord, for those that, man, they just need to get, they need to go all in on their marriage. They need to 
cut off all those side things they've got going, and they need to commit fully to the person you've given them to love, to their kids, to their spouse. Lord, I pray for those that are feeling a call to ministry or to get involved in serving here. Lord, I pray that they would just get rid of their excuses and say, I'm going all the way in. I'm going to fully commit to this. And I believe that on the other side of this, there are blessings beyond anything I can see. But I can't see it now, but I'm going to fully commit. I thank you, Lord, that you give us the power to make those hard decisions. But on the other side of it, there's a huge, massive blessing beyond anything we could ever imagine. If you're here this morning and you have not made that first all-in commitment to give your life to Jesus, I'm going to give you a chance to do that. And I'm going to say a prayer, and if you say this prayer and mean it with all your heart, God is going to come. He's going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness, put you into the kingdom of light, and set you up an eternal address with him. Let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way, and we turn to your way. Help us to walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you in the back. Welcome to the adventure. Man, my prayer for you guys this week is that you'll... Count the cost, figure out what it's going to take, but decide to go all in. Don't wait till January 1st. Start now. Do it now. You guys be blessed. You are dismissed. Have a great week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.